<clears throat> okay, I spent most of the time last week talking about Mary Magdalene and who she really was and what we really know about her and what we don't know about her. And then we talked about the painting of the Last Supper. And Keith Ward asked me, when was that painted? And I said, I don't know. And when did Leonardo da Vinci live? And I said, I don't know. But I looked it up in the World Book Encyclopedia last night. Leonardo da Vinci lived from 1452 <laughs> to 1519. Thank you, Scott. And, hey, hey all right. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Yes, yes. He painted the Last Supper in 1495 yeah. in the Monastery of Santa Maria della Grazie. And that's fun to say. Except if you're Italian and you say stuff like that all the time. In the World Book, which is interesting to read, it's always interesting to read, but I found it interesting that the article in the World Book on Leonardo da Vinci said that he had many interests, and it listed off the interests like architecture and uh, invention and science and the human body. But then it said he had absolutely no interest in religion. So... Somehow the people who put the world book together came up with that and decided that he had absolutely no interest in religion. So that I wonder what Dan Brown would have to say, the author of the Da Vinci Code, about that. So anyway, let's hear it for the world book. It, mm -hmm. The world book still works. You don't have to look everything up on the Internet. Okay, the book that I found most interesting about Mary Magdalene, talked about this last week, is a book by Bruce Chilton, and you can find this at Cokesbury. You can get it on Amazon. You could probably get it at Borders. It's not a real hard read, but it compiles what he knows about Mary Magdalene, what we have in Scripture, and what the truths are about her from Scripture. Was she the woman with the nard? Was she the woman with the hair and who cleaned Jesus' feet and all that stuff? And we need to separate out all the Marys in the Bible. There were lots and lots of Marys in the Bible. There was Mary of Bethany, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, Mary the wife of Clopas, um, Mary the mother of Jesus, of course, and then unnamed women, women that are never named, the woman who is listed as having a bad name. She was the woman with the hair and the ointment, the nard. Uh, the Samaritan woman at the well, who did not have a name, and the adulteress that the Pharisees wanted to stone. I did two days of freewheel this week, and somebody threw a rock at me from a, from a moving car, and I thought, wow, that hurt so bad, I can't imagine being stoned to death. So, But I was not caught in adultery at the time. <laughs> I was just riding my bicycle. Gee. Oh, but there are people out there who don't like bikers, and they, they didn't like me that day. Anyway, that would be an awful way to die. But anyway, she does not have a name. She is not Mary Magdalene. She is not specifically named. But over time, we have come to believe, uh, because of various things, that it was her, that it really was Mary Magdalene. Uh, there was a pope in 591, Pope Gregory the Great, who did a sermon series on Mary Magdalene, and he named her as the woman with the hair and the nard, the woman who was about to be stoned, and the woman at the well. So he just kind of collated her into one person and laminated it and made it this one thing that you couldn't separate. So for, for many centuries, a lot of people have believed that all those, sin, basically every sinful woman in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, was Mary Magdalene. We talked about the Gospel of Mary, which is an apocryphal book that we don't have in our Bible. Uh, it has a lot of different stories in it. it. It pretty much portrays Mary Magdalene as someone who was a leader in the church, who had to butt heads with some of the male disciples, and some of the other male disciples really stood up for her and fought her cause. I'm trying to think of what else I want to cover. I guess the main thing about that is don't believe anything don't believe everything you read about Mary Magdalene and don't assume that every adulterous person who's female in the New Testament is Mary Magdalene. Okay, any questions on what we talked about last week before I turn it over to Bill for today? Oh good, everybody learned everything. Okay. And I thought it might be helpful today if we save our questions till the end of the time. 
Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. All right. Well, for today, we're going to talk about kind of the Catholic side, because the Catholics certainly didn't fare well in this uh, in the book and the movie uh, at all. And I thought, let's, let's talk about uh, particular pieces, especially Opus Dei, and that's where I want to start today. I'm, I'm going to pull from several of the uh, articles and, and resources that were given to uh, both of us, uh, some from Dr. Biggs and some from uh, several of you, and I, I found some interesting tidbits in there. This one's from the New Yorker about Opus Dei. It says, <clears throat> Opus Dei is a unique community begun in 1928 by a Spanish priest named Jose Maria Escriva. I think I'm, am I saying that good? Uh, well, I should say, who envisioned a world made holier by a cadre of deeply pious lay people committed to expressing their spiritual devotion through their everyday work in the secular world. That, Escriva uh, believed, was truly God's work, opus dei, God's work. Members undertake rigorous theological and spiritual formation, something like that of candidates for a religious order, with a critical core, about 25%, pledging celibacy and living together in gender-segregated Opus Dei centers, such as the one uh, that was written about in the book. Uh, I want to say New York City. But was it New York City or Washington? New York City, yeah, on 34th Street. Uh, Opus Dei now has, according to this article, 87,000 members worldwide with about 3,000 in the United States. Uh, its traditional rival, the Jesuits, have about 20,000. Okay, so, so it's a larger order than that. A little more than half of the members are women, and the great majority, called supernuminaries, are married, and apart from the intensity of their devotion, lead conventional lives. A sizable proportion of Opus Dei members, under the guidance of a spiritual director, voluntarily take up the practice of corporal mortification, wearing the psyllis. Now, if you saw the movie, you, you saw a picture of that. That's the thing around their thigh, you know, that digs in. Now, the one in the movie was like, oh my gosh, torture chamber uh, uh, kind of thing. I mean, it dug in and he pulled it so tight, you know, that was... That's not what uh, most members uh, are doing. They, they take, it, take this up wearing the psyllis for about two hours most days and using the discipline. Now, in the articles that I, that I was reading, the discipline is this small cord-like whip that some members use once a week to flagellate themselves. That's, you know, back on the, on the back. That's, that's the, the flagellation. Uh, during the recitation of a prayer, okay? I'm not suggesting these as, as uh, uh, possibilities for your prayer life, not at all. I'm just saying, I'm just saying describing what uh, these folks are doing. Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa, I mentioned in my sermon, uh, wore a psyllis. How about that? Yeah, and used the discipline uh, as well, telling her sisters, if I am sick, I take five strokes. I must feel its need in order to share in the passion of Christ and the sufferings of our poor. Again, it's a connection with the suffering of Christ. I mean, that is the intent of it. I, their, their feeling is, I don't agree with this, but their feeling is I need to feel physically the passion, uh, the, the hurting of, of our Lord. Uh, so, so anyway, that's, that's one Piece. We talked about how it started back in 1928. Uh, let's see, I've already actually covered that. I'm now turning to a Time magazine. They did a, you know, of course, front page several weeks ago, back in April, several weeks ago, several months ago, uh, back then. And uh, let's see, Opus uh, Dei's core is, we talked about the supernuminaries, but there are also numinaries, all right? about 20% of the membership uh, who, despite remaining lay uh, persons, pledge celibacy and live together in uh, one of these centers. Uh, there, there was a story about one particular woman, Kathy Hickey, 
said while she was raising seven children uh, in the Anything Goes 70s, it says, uh, Kathy Hickey, uh, uh, she says, Opus gave her an underlying stream of peace and joy. Members bring a pious concentration to jobs that might otherwise be less be done less ethically or carefully. Uh, this, this, um, uh, this woman says, Opus helps your whole life melt into this 24-7 conversation with God. So I wanted to share you know, a little bit, some people who find it very, very meaningful to, to be a part of uh, Opus Dei and find it to be spiritually satisfying as well. Uh, it's interesting, the article, Time article says, Opus Dei is best known for being secretive. Uh, it's their line, secretive. O Opus will not identify its members, and many prefer not to identify themselves. It's not, you know, so surprising, but, but uh, still. Uh, they, they wanted to point that piece out, and they talked about their finances. They said on the basis of their study of IRS filings, uh, two guys found $344 million in Opus assets in the United States alone and uh, a global total of $2.8 billion. Uh, quite a bit. Uh, Opus members and, and sympathizers, known as cooperators, a lot of names here, can be very generous and their funds can be hard to track, says Time Magazine. Uh, Opus Dei informs about a million conservative Catholics. And that's just about 1.5% of the 67 million Catholics nationally. All right? So just a few items on here. Oh, let's talk a little more about, they had a section on, do members really whip themselves? Uh, numinaries, it says, are expected, although not compelled, to wear the psyllis, a small chain, we, we got that you know, around the thigh, for two hours a day, we said that, and, the, and use the discipline. Um, Catholic, okay, wait, Catholic laity and luminaries, including Mother Teresa, uh, have used it to identify with Christ. I'm, I'm repeating myself. I'm sorry. I'm repeating myself on that. So a little uh, personal reflection on, on Opus Dei. I would say, that, that the Opus Dei uh, group is really more the fundamentalist side of Catholic faith. All right, we all have our fundamentalist sides. The Methodist Church has you know, part, uh, groups within them that are fundamentalist. I would consider Opus Dei to be more on those lines. A very conservative group. Uh, I, I would, they're very traditional. There are two popes, very recent popes, that, that uh, consider Opus Dei to be uh, high in their, in their minds. One was jo John Paul, Pope John Paul, who just died. The next would be the current Pope, Pope Benedict, uh, is also one who, who thinks very highly of, of uh, Opus Dei. Those were both pretty conservative bishops, and Benedict would be even more so than, than Pope John Paul. So uh, my own uh, uh, thoughts on that. And, uh, you know, with that, they get a lot of press. I mean, just as, you know, because they come out and they, they make statements and, and they, they get a lot of press for some of the things they say. I'm going to move on. Okay, just hold questions for right now. I'm going to move on to some other pieces that I want to talk about. One is the priori of Sion, all right? The priori of Sion. Um, <clears throat> this historic priori of Sion was a religious community founded in Jerusalem in the year 1099. Very, very old. 1099, immediately after the First Crusade. It had no special relationship with the Knights Templar. I'm going to be talking about the Knights Templar in just a minute. After their church was destroyed, during a Muslim attack in 1219, the priests of the Priory withdrew to Sicily, okay, outside of Italy there. In 1617, they joined the Jesuits and then disappeared. Nevertheless, the Priory still flourishes in fantasy. 
According to theories popularized in the book, Holy Blood, Holy Grail. How many folks out there have even have read that? Ah, uh, just a couple. Yeah, I knew. That's the one, you know, that was uh, uh, came out long before Da Vinci Code and that the lawsuit was all about. You know, thought they stole, that Dan Brown stole all this material from him. Uh, according to uh, uh, that book, the Priory had a hidden mission, all right? guarding the secret bloodline descended from Jesus and Mary Magdalene. According to this legend, Jesus' lineage passed through the Merovingian dynasty of France. I'll say a little more about that. Uh, Merovingians, let me, I can't just throw that word out there. Excuse me. Merovingians, am I pronouncing that correctly? I'm doing my best. I am. There's the French woman right there. So, all right, good. Were, they were the king's of the Franks, a Germanic people, German uh, people, who conquered what is now France in the late 5th century. That's all I'm going to say about that for right now. Uh, they, the, um, this legend, According to the legend, Jesus' lineage passed through this Mer Merovingian dynasty of France and the crusader, uh, de Bou uh, Geoffrey of Bouillon, Bouillon? Like the chicken, I would say bouillon, bouillon, so I was going to try to give it some. Uh, yeah, I messed up. Jesus' lineage, uh, according to the legend, it still exists, that this lineage and, and uh, uh, all this still exists. The idea of a still existing priori with a shocking secret was, in fact, invented by a convicted French con man named Pierre Plantard. Did anybody see the 60 Minutes special on, on, on this? This was several weeks ago, probably about a month ago. It was good. Yeah, I, I copied it. I thought about bringing it in here, but, you know, it's like 15 minutes long. It would have taken a while. But it was very interesting. They, had, they went back in footage way back uh, years ago, and this guy, Pierre Plantard, um, was this con man. And uh, he, let's see, he was invented by this con man on the model of a 19th, century esoteric society, the Order of the Rose. How do you pronounce that? C-R-O-I-X? Qua. You're so good. You better get up here and stand behind me. And all that. Uh, Rose Qua of the Temple of the Grail. The only modern priori of Sion was a short-lived club registered by Plantard. Hey, fancy that. In 1956. So long, long ago, we're talking almost, well, 50 years ago. What am I saying? 50 years ago. But Plantard and his accomplices later fabricated false documentation for the Priory. I mean, when you heard, probably in the news, that, that um, da, da Vinci's name was on this list that was discovered, and also uh, the fellow with the apple, Sir Isaac Newton, uh, his name you know, appeared uh, on this list and, and several others. It was like, oh my gosh, and all of these were a part of this secret society that were guarding the lineage of Jesus from way back when? You know, that's the, that's the book the book's premise. Uh, it was like, oh my, how could this have happened? Well, it was all fake. Uh, and, and uh, you know, they fabricated this false documentation which claimed to have enrolled thousands of important people uh, under the Grand Master Plantard, heir to the holy blood and throne of France, and these claims wilted under investigation, including a debunking by the BBC in 1992. So a French court forced Plantard to admit his hoax under oath in 1993. So there you have it. Okay, it's on record. Uh, uh, go to France. You can you can go back and and uh, and, and uh, or get the BBC documentary, whatever. But 60 Minutes, I tell you, it's it's just bunk uh, on that. Okay, priori of science. Let's shift now to the Holy Grail. Let's talk a little bit about the Holy Grail. Uh, according to medieval legend, the Holy Grail is the vessel of the Last Supper. It's the vessel of the Last Supper. Afterwards used to catch drops of Christ's blood at the cross, is the legend. Different versions depict it as even a platter, not so much a cup, a platter. Um, 
and also a cup of the wine uh, or the chalice, a container for the bread uh, also. It's been seen as a dish for the Paschal lamb uh, and, and even a white stone on which a wafer was laid. Uh, Holy Communion, though, is always the focus around the Holy Grail. Holy Communion. The Grail first appears in a 12th century poem. Okay? In a poem. Uh, And the poem was titled, I'd say, Percival. That's good enough for you. Okay. Amy said, fine by me. Uh, first of all, as it was a poem uh, done as a mysterious serving dish containing a single communion wafer. So in this poem, again, so an artistic uh, license, shall we say. And Robert de Boron rewrote the poem in the year 1200, turning the dish into a cup called the Holy Grail, used at the Last Supper and brought to England by Joseph of Arimathea. So again, it was written as uh, a, a, as an art, artistic piece, okay? Not based on fact or truth, per se, but as an artistic piece. The most mystical form of the story uh, from the early 13th century has King Arthur's three purest knights finding the precious cup after a long, long search. And then Christ himself appears and gives them communion from the grail. I I would have liked to have been there for that. That would have been incredible. After which it was taken away to heaven. So, So there, you know, and here are these accounts going around. And back, you know, in those days when there weren't printing presses and there weren't books and all this kind of thing, happening, you know, these legends would get started, and you know how stories go. They get embellished, and they get passed around more and more, and so legends are are born, and you believe those things, and they seem to be true, not according to uh, uh, these sources. Uh, This particular account of the Grail quest was incorporated into Thomas Mallory's a uh, work called Morte, uh, I, can't, I just can't pronounce this stuff, M-O-R-T-E, Mort, Mort, Darthur, Darthur, Mort Darthur, you get up here and say this, she says it so well, Mort Darthur, there you go, in 1470, the best version of the Arthurian, Arthur legends in English. Medieval stories about the Holy Grail reflect contemporary ideas about Eucharistic miracles, such as levitating communion wafers or appearances of Jesus during Mass. They also appear to draw on pagan or Celtic myths about ever-filled, always-filled vessels of food and drink, of cauldrons of regeneration and adventures in the happy other world. But the pagan borrowings always serve a Christian purpose. The grail does not symbolize Mary Magdalene as the bearer of Christ's child, although it might possibly stand for the Virgin Mary, whose pregnant body did contain Christ himself. Okay? So, here's just a little synopsis on the Holy Grail itself. And we saw, I mean, the best <clears throat> movie recently uh, that I saw of it was the Indiana Jones one. Uh, I loved that one. I loved it when he when he steps out. You know, he's on that cliff and he steps out. You remember that scene? And there's nothing there and suddenly the bridge appears as he steps because he has faith and he walks and they find the Grail. Oh, it's great. It's just super. You know, I remember watching it and just thinking, I wonder if that's true. You know, I wonder if that's true. Well, no, it's not true uh, like that. But it's a great legend. And again, we have to to remember biblical writings as well. This 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 impacts us as 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 you study the Bible each each week here with Doctor Biggs. 
you know, we have to think about the writing down and, and the, the passing along of stories just because a story is not true, okay, or it didn't happen factually, all right, such as, let's say, the creation story that, that's written uh, there. It's, it's, you know, did that actually happen? You know, so many people today ask that question. Did that actually happen? I mean, was it seven days? I want to know. Seven days? How many hours is that? And did he finish it 22 hours? Or did he, you know, those kind of questions. We ask that. The biblical writers and the, and the Hebrews, they weren't asking those questions. But what was being passed along in those stories were things about God, were things about their religion. They were passing along particular truths, things that the writers wanted to say about this wonderful Yahweh in their lives, to, to take that story. And it served a purpose for their community. And they learned about God, that God created all of this, and that a powerful God as that is my God, and, and that that God protects me. And those kinds of, of truths, you know, help us live our lives. They help us to, to walk through each day with confidence and strength. So, so just because, you know, I just want to say that, you know, we've got stories here that become legends, and, and I always want to kind of go behind them. So, so what is being said? Why were those stories so popular? You know, there has to be a reason. Why, and, and you know, we're going to talk about next week, why is Da Vinci Code so popular and disturbing too? What, what is it? What, what is it about this uh, mystery uh, that has captured our imaginations? We're going to, we're going to say some uh, good things about that next week, aren't you? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. I know you are. So, all right. Where should I go back? Ah, the Knights Templar. Now, I am a Demolay, and you know what Demolay is. Uh, though, how many how many Demolays we have out there? Oh, we do have some. How about that? Very good. Uh, Demolays. Any Eastern stars? Any Rainbow Girls? From our Rainbow? There we have a Rainbow Girl. Right like that. Okay, part of the Masonic uh, order and and uh, that group. And you know, when I came up, I was I was in Demolay in the seventies, and there is some so there's some book work. There was some secret. Uh, uh, words that we say, you know, at our meetings that we did, and and they have actually evolved from that uh, uh, quite a bit, uh, just with the times and everything like that. You know, it's uh, in, at least in D. Malay. I have a good friend here in in uh, Tulsa named Curtis Gimlin, and he was my chapter dad in Oklahoma City at the Will Rogers chapter. I can make a plug for that, but. But again, why am I saying all this? Well, because, you know, when we talk about the Knights Templar, uh, uh, these, these secret organizations, these kind of organizations come to the forefront. And there's been a lot, as you've heard, said about the Masons uh, and, and it's their, their secrets. And that someone came to me and, and brought the, uh, uh, you know, the map of Washington, D.C. Uh, have, you, have you heard that one? Where, where they say, you know, you know Washington, D.C. was mapped out according to some secret uh, Masonic uh, lines and how it all fits together. And, and I'm sure it was mapped out, you know, by some good architects, you know, as to where things were going to set. But, but those, those stories get brought in. And the Knights Templar, as being a part of Dee Molay, there was a play that we did. Uh, that, that, and I got to play Jacques de Molay, was his, his name in this play. It was a wonderful one, and we kept talking about the Knights Templar. And, you know, I was in high school. And I didn't even know what the Knights Templar was, but I, I did the part well, uh, nonetheless. I did it well, but I, I just thought, who are those guys? Well, here I'm going to tell you right now. The Knights Templar, formerly known more as the Poor Knights of Christ and the Temple of Solomon, the Knights Templar were warrior monks in the Middle Ages. And in 1118, 19 years after the First Crusade conquered the Holy Land, nine French knights took vows to protect pilgrims. Uh, we're doing fine. After their monastic rule was, was approved in 1128, the new group developed into a formidable fighting force. Though they were they were forced to be uh, contended with. They were enrolling knights, 
men at arms and even support staff for them. They became international bankers to handle the donations from, uh, from, that, from those that funded their campaigns in the East. All right? But when the Crusaders were driven out in 1291, so that's a long time later, so almost 200 years, uh, the Templars became obsolete. Their wealth and rumors of misconduct led King Philip of France to arrest all of his kingdom's Templars in the year 1307. So they enjoyed a pretty long period of time as, as very esteemed, uh, very well thought of uh, warriors and very helpful to the kings especially. But using evidence obtained after torture, this King Philip of France persuaded the weak pope at that time named Clement V, who was a resident of France, uh, that the order of the Templars, uh, the Knights Templar, was, they, that they were guilty of blasphemy, sodomy, it says, and idolatry. As many as 120 Templars, including their Grand Master, were burned at the stake. Ugh. The king confiscated their wealth, and the order was disbanded everywhere in the year 1312. So former members, if they were there, you know, get out of town was one, you know, but they, uh, they joined other orders and uh, went on their way. But unlike the picture that is painted in the Da Vinci Code, all right, there is no reputable historian that thinks that the Templars were idol worshipers, or participants in fertility rites, or dabblers in heresies. Uh, the, these were uncultured people, right? And, and they were often illiterate. Uh, but they did not invent, as Dan Brown has said, invent Gothic architecture. Uh, they were not great builders, and were not, uh, and, and, and uh, nor were there few round churches. Uh, you know, they, they did have a few round churches, that was not evidence of secret paganism. The order did not hide out, hide out in Scotland, much less survive another three centuries to found the Freemasons. Okay, I mean, that's, that was the idea. You know, they, they survived all that time. But because of their cruel fate, the Templars did become the focus of absurd speculations. I mean, they were imagined to be the ancient wisdom, to be, excuse me, the carriers of ancient wisdom handed down from Atlantis, uh, that they were guardians of the Holy Grail, that they were discoverers of America. This is, these are all various theories that have been passed on, that they were possessors of vast riches uh, and plotters against tyranny. Their story is supposedly coded into tarot cards, uh, which were actually devised for a harmless renaissance game long, long ago. Uh, 18th century occultists, occultists tried to refound the Templars, and Knight Templar became the highest degree in Royal Arch Freemasonry. But the unfortunate Knights continue to inspire esoteric, histories and speculative novels still going on out there, enduring, I love this line, enduring twice as long in fantasy as they did in actuality. Okay, so uh, a lot has been said when you hear these things, you know, about Knights Templar, just know they, they were a long time ago, you know, a thousand years ago, and they basically died out. Uh, all right, with that, <clears throat> I've got one other piece that I want to share, which was a lot of fun. I thought somebody handed me this, and it was, it was from the magazine Time Out. Uh, it says Time Out Chicago, but nonetheless, it's, it's, it's titled A Glitch in the Code. A Glitch in the Code. Uh, so if you gave this to me, thank you, thank you. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty funny. Uh, it says the uh, Da Vinci Code posits... Uh, 
puts forth that Christ's bloodline persists to this day, but it depicts this in mathematically naive terms, as if meant uh, as if it meant that a limited number of French people alive today would be identifiable as Jesus' heirs and heiresses. And it goes on and says, any genealogist or historical demographer will tell you this is nonsense. If Jesus' DNA joined the gene pool around A.D. 33, okay, and didn't die out within the first generations, then practically everyone alive today who is of European extraction would have an equal claim to being one of Jesus' descendants. And that includes Carrot Top, Dick Cheney, and Anna Nicole Smith. All right? <laughs> I love that. Uh, uh, this author, Cliff Dirksen, says, it is virtually impossible for a child born 2,000 years ago to have just a handful of living descendants. But that's the idea that's given. Oh, they're here. You know, and they're just kept, you know, in France. They're over there. Uh, he says, either there would be no descendants, uh, the first few generations, reproductive success is critical here, or else there would be millions of them. Okay? Very good. I thought that was, that was pretty good if you want to see that again. So a little glitch in the code and how that theory gets passed on. Okay, basically that's what I have for us for today. I don't think I could say a little more about the Merovingians if you'd like, but uh, I think I'm going to stop with that. So let's go to questions and, and uh, see what you've got out there. We'll come... So, am I missing? Am I, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, 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 please. Yes, it is. I had an uncle who was a Masonic, and uh, I begged him to give me the secret. He said they had a secret. Oh, <laughs> they had a secret. He wants a, to know the secret of the... Of the Demolay and, and, the, the, and the Masons and this kind of thing. We have, there is a secret handshake that we do. Uh, there is that, but I can't show you that. Uh, I can't show you that. I'd have to kill you. Uh, uh, there is that, and there are, I mean, what we have in Demolay, what, what has evolved since I was there in the, in the 70s, and I was speaking with my friend, uh, Curtis Gimlin. He says, you know, uh, it used to be that we'd have the meetings behind closed doors and we'd have just the members come in and do this. And some things we could do in uh, uh, public and we'd invite folks in for an installation of officers, this kind of thing. But the others, you know, some of the readings that we do were kept secret. And he tells me today that in Malay we really don't have the, the secrets like that. And it, it wasn't so much secret. It was just words that were used for, for a a long time that were shared at the beginning of the meetings that we'd have. And I can't speak for Masons, because I am not a Mason, so, so any Masons out there that can speak, please do, please do. She's saying, what is the secret? Tell us those secrets. Stand up right here, get to that microphone. The secret with Masonry is that there are no secrets. Okay, very good, <laughs> very good. Okay, excellent. So that, I mean, it, it, maybe, Perhaps at one time it served a purpose, you know, for a group that's, that's forming, and it may have been around, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't know the history well enough, so I'm speaking way out of hat, but, you know, for an organization to survive, just like early Christianity, you know, it's kind of like you've got to meet behind closed doors, you've got to be very careful what you say, and you had secret codes, you know, the fish symbol uh, to do that. And all I can guess is that things were done for a while, and some of those traditions lasted. And again, it helps you helps form you as a community. This is who we are, and and we have some certain things that separate us, make us different from the rest, and and helps us as a community. So, other questions? Okay, all right, good. Please. Oh, question over here. Yes. Okay, Alan. Hold on. Oh, I got to get right next to you. Hold on. That Easter is to be missing in the Bible. Now, when Christ had already risen, yes. he came down to the tomb of, of 
a grave saw Merrimack and cried. And he said, why are you crying? I just wondered that those two personally was Mary Magdalene really his wife? Oh, you're asking, it Can was Mary Magdalene really his wife? You know, here Jesus comes down uh, after being raised from the dead and sees uh, Mary Magdalene at the tomb. It, does that mean that they are married? You I'd dealt like with this. You, yeah, you get to do this. Okay, if Dr. Biggs uh, were killed suddenly and we all went to his tomb, don't you think we'd be crying? But we're not all married to Dr. Biggs. That's, that sounded so dumb. But Dr. Biggs is our senior pastor. He's our spiritual leader. He's been my pastor since I was eight years old. So I would be very upset if he died an untimely death, and I might go to his grave and cry, but that doesn't mean that there was some kind of extra special relationship going on. I think she was one of his closest, she was one of Jesus' closest followers, and she was in a band of people that were under persecution, under threat of death. They were extremely stressed out, as we would say, and she was there at the tomb grieving, as as anybody who was a close follower of Jesus would have be would have been. I don't think that necessarily means that she was Jesus' wife. Yeah. Okay, Debbie. Was Mary Magdalene unofficially or officially the thirteenth disciple? She was. She was not one of the twelve. So she was between, you know, 13 and 25. I don't know if they alphabetized their names and <laughs> came in a certain order, but all we can say is she was a part of the inner circle. In my book, she is. I mean, I, I, I mean she was one of the inner, yeah, inner circle, so that's important to me. I think she was uh, right up there. Uh, she was one of the boys. Okay, one of the boys. <laughs> Please. Why was there no cup or grail in the in the painting of the Last Supper? I know. We had it. It's sitting. We had the picture. I could go get it. I don't know where it is. He forgot to put it in. That's right. He ran out of <laughs> he, that color of he paint. He fell asleep. I. I guess to, I'd like to answer this first, and you can add to it if you want. I guess the importance is not so much the cup as it is the betrayal because the painting is portraying the fact that we, we assume as we look at the painting that Jesus has just said, one of you who dips his bread with me is going to betray me. And so then you see all these guys going, oh, you know, all these right. postures of shock and disappointment and rage. So the important thing about the painting for art historians and for religious people is not necessarily, hey, where's that cup? But they just all realized, there's trouble, there's something rotten in Denmark here. That's my answer to that question. Well, it's interesting how you ask the question, you know, where was the Holy Grail? And again, if the Holy Grail, as we've heard, is kind of comes from a poem, this kind of thing, they're not asking that question per se. They just, you, you, your question really is, why was there no cup there, really, instead of saying it as the Holy Grail? Uh, and so that, I wouldn't know what else to say, except just the, the, the focus was different for, for Da Vinci. Uh, and that's that's where they met. Just as we said, they weren't sitting behind a table, you know, all in one line uh, by any means. They were reclining in a circle. You know, it was it was done very differently. So that, that kind of he had a message he wanted to get across. That was it. Please.
Okay. Can I speak to that first? Uh, <clears throat> I think I could say uh, yes to both of those. Uh, that, that, that means women being second-class citizens would not be considered a part of the story, in, this, in essence. And yet Jesus, you know, made them a part of the story by picking, you know, particular ones and being a part of that. So one thing that, that you know, didn't come out of last week, but I thought was interesting, a uh, question to ask, could Jesus have been married? And, and I, you know, I, would, I could say myself, you know, he could have been, yeah. And, and would it have made any difference if he was to you? I mean, I'm really curious. What is, what is, makes your faith different if Jesus was married? And I'm not saying to Mary Magdalene. I think we pretty well established that he wasn't married to Mary Magdalene. But could he have been married to someone else? Well... Yeah, he could have been. Uh, that is possible. Yes, she could have been kept in the background, this kind of thing. But again, I want to ask, so what? I just want to ask that. I want to put that out there. And I want to hear some answers back from you. What, what difference does that make for you as believers, uh, as, as people of the faith? How does that change who Jesus is for you? All right, Debbie. Okay, it rewrites the stories for you. Okay, it changes, meaning the stories that I've read are just not true at all. Okay, all right, pretty strong statement there. Yes. Does God, ha does God have great, great, I mean, we're it right here. I mean, I can tell you, I mean, we are great, great, we are children of God, we are it right here. So, but for you, okay, kind of a DNA part, part like that. Okay, some others, please. Good point. Good point. In the back. Speak up. I mean, it is. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, she was saying. It was, it, was, it was a good possibility that he was and that it, it made sense to you that, that, he, that he could have been. There was another one here, please. And makes him more human. Makes him more human. Right. It's, and and that, I, I'd like to say something to please. that too. We don't usually think about Jesus eating, going to the bathroom, throwing up, you know, bleeding, having a cold, uh, wearing diapers, needing to wear diapers. I'm trying to think of all the really disgusting <laughs> things that we all do because we're a human. And right. so he probably, if he's if he's fully God and fully human, he probably did all of those things. So, so how much? How much stuff, how much human stuff did he do? And we'll never know. And that, but that is the issue right there. That's it. How divine is Jesus? How human is Jesus? It's the one that the Arians dealt with back at the Nicene Creed uh, or Council of Nicaea. And it's still with us today. I mean, it still is with us today. And this book brings that out. Now, there's a very enthusiastic hand at the back with Angie Hooper. I got to call on you, Angie. Angie this, this has to be the last one because we got to close up. Okay. 
You can do that. It is. Well, it next is. week, in, we'll we'll define how we we'll decide how we define sin, and we'll talk about how we feel about sexuality. I think we can do that in an hour. Oh, Don't you yeah. think? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Come we'll back just, and bring a friend. We'll just tie it up in a big red bow. But uh, uh, very good discussion. I mean, these are these are good questions to ask because because it, it does raise raise up those issues. Uh, I would invite you to go if you have internet and can go go to beliefnet beliefnet.org. And there's a, there's a particular piece that talks about uh, uh, the Jesus being married piece, and you just click on it and it starts playing. It's very good. And it talks about the celibacy of our heroes, our leaders, Paul, Jesus, this kind of thing. And, and, it, and it, it talks about that, that he, this person feels that Jesus did align himself with that line of celibacy throughout time. I just I want to put that in the uh, in the mix out there too, uh, which also makes sense. So it's again this is we're speculating here. He's a good he's a good Hebrew man. Yes, uh, could it have happened? Yes, it could have happened. Did it happen? That you know we don't know. But it, and it comes down to this issue of divinity, humanity. Uh, how much? How how little? So so very good. Thank you for that. Uh, I got to go preach another sermon. So I'm going to close things off uh, for today and then come back next week when we will do a wrap-up. We'll talk about um, uh, why has this book been so influential for us and, and uh, in, our, in, this, in the United States especially. So let's bow our heads. Gracious God, we are intrigued. Our curiosity is piqued. We have so many questions uh, that this incredible book has raised for us and we continue to struggle wrestle and uh, feel uh, also that our faith has been confirmed too so for all these questions and for everything that we do we just give thanks to you uh, bless our work uh, here and send us out uh, throughout this next week uh, to continue our work in the world for it's in christ's name we pray amen